Welcome to today's program in the Our Finger Lakes History Series. I am Seneca County historian Walter Gable. Today's program deals with William Henry Seward, a very famous resident of Auburn, New York. William Henry Seward had a most distinguished public career. Following his service in the New York State Senate, he served four years as New York State Governor. He served 12 years in the United States Senate at a time when the slavery issue was increasingly a burning issue. He then served as Secretary of State under both President Abraham Lincoln and President Andrew Johnson. William Henry Seward was born in 1801 in the village of Florida, New York, the fourth son in the family. Florida, New York, as you can see in this map, is located about 60 miles north of New York City and west of the Hudson River. His parents were Samuel Sweezy Seward and Mary Jennings Seward. His father, Samuel, was educated to be a physician, and he was a wealthy landowner farmer who owned slaves. His father, Samuel, had served in the New York State Legislature and was the first judge of Orange County. At the age of 15, William, who was known as Henry at that time, entered Union College in Schenectady, New York in 1816 as a sophomore. He excelled in his studies at Union College, but left the college in December 1818 because his father kept him short of money. William or Henry went to Georgia where he briefly taught school and sadly witnessed the ill treatment of slaves. He returned to New York at the urging of his family in June 1819. He then studied law by working in a law office in Goshen, New York. He returned to Union College and graduated with highest honors in June 1820. He was admitted to the New York State Bar in 1822. William Henry Seward, decided to practice law in Auburn, New York, about 150 miles west of Albany. He saw that western New York was a rapidly growing area and thus offered him more potential legal business. Seward joined the law practice of retired Judge Elijah Miller, whose daughter, Frances Adeline Miller, was a classmate of Seward's sister Cornelia at Emma Willard's Troy Female Seminary. Seward married Frances Miller on October 20th, 1824. She was known as Franny. Seward and his wife lived in Elijah Miller's mansion along with her father, Elijah. Seward served in the New York State Senate from 1830 to 1834. He was a Whig candidate for New York State governor in 1834, but lost that election. He was, however, elected governor in the next election and served four years as New York State governor. As New York State governor, he tried to use the power of state government to expand internal improvements, such as railroads and canals, and for public education. He also worked for the reform of prisons and insane asylums, and he won legislation to better the position of immigrants. Perhaps most significantly, he became a political spokesman for New York State's anti-slavery movement. Following his four years as governor, he returned to his law practice in Auburn. It was in these years that William and his wife Frances 
used the kitchen in their Auburn home as a station on the Underground Railroad. The kitchen was located in the basement of the mansion. I can't emphasize enough that this kitchen was being used as a station on the Underground Railroad while William Henry Seward was New York State Governor and United States Senator, two elected positions in which he had taken an oath to support the United States Constitution, yet he was de not defying federal laws to help fugitive slaves, we call them freedom seekers today, to help fugitive slaves escape to Canada because he and his wife were so opposed to slavery. In 1849, Seward began serving in the United States Senate as a member of the Whig Party. This picture gives us an image of a U.S. Senator, not Seward, however, making an impassioned speech. Seward did make a memorable anti-slavery speech on March 11, 1850, when he declared that territorial expansion of slavery was contrary to the U.S. Constitution and contrary to higher law. That speech made Seward the foremost political leader of the anti-slavery forces. In 1858, Seward made a speech in Rochester, New York, in which he electrified the country with his irrepressible conflict speech. In that speech, he said that either the entire country had to become entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation. That speech prompted U.S. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger B. Tawney, to say that if Seward were to be elected president in 1860, that Tawney would refuse to administer the oath of office to him. That Rochester, New York speech incensed many Southerners who said that this speech set the tone that led to John Brown's 1859 raid on Harper's Ferry in an attempt to start a slave rebellion throughout the South. That speech also led a Richmond, Virginia newspaper to offer a $50,000 reward for the head of that traitor, William H. Seward. Seward's strong anti-slavery stands made him the leading candidate for the Republican presidential nomination in 1860. Abraham Lincoln, of course, beat out Seward for the Republican Party's presidential nominee in 1860. Lincoln went on to win the presidency and he made Seward his Secretary of State. In the visual at the very bottom, you see Seward seated front and center in this cabinet picture with President Lincoln to the left. If you have seen the recent movie Lincoln, you are well aware that Seward became a most trusted advisor to President Lincoln. Shown at top, you will also see pictures of the covers of two biographies of Seward. Both book titles suggest the importance of Seward in Lincoln's cabinet. Interestingly, however, shortly after becoming Secretary of State, Seward gave Lincoln a paper in which Seward offered to make the tough decisions for the president if Lincoln didn't want to make them himself. Lincoln responded by putting Seward down, but he kept Seward as Secretary of State, and he, Seward, went on to become the very trusted confidant of Lincoln. 
Here you see Seward on the front page of Harper's Weekly just one month after Lincoln was inaugurated as president. This shows how very important Seward was at the time in this position as Secretary of State. This is a photo of Seward while he served as Secretary of State. We probably all know that Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at the Ford's Theater on the night of April 14, 1865. That same night, there was a plot by Southern sympathizers to also kill Vice President Andrew Johnson and also Secretary of State Seward, and thus throw the federal government into complete disarray without the top three people in the executive branch. That night that Lincoln was murdered, Seward was laid up in bed. He had been in a serious carriage accident just nine days earlier that had left him close to death. One of John Wilkes Booth's co-conspirators, Lewis Powell, also known as Lewis Payne, talked his way into the Seward house that night, pretending that he was delivering medicine. Stopped on the stairs by Seward's son, Frederick, Powell panicked, attacking Frederick and dashing into the Secretary of State's bedroom. He stabbed Seward multiple times, injured another of Seward's sons and Seward's bodyguard and retreated into night thinking he had mortally wounded the Secretary of State. It was only after Powell was captured the next day that he discovered that Seward was still alive. Seward went on to make a full recovery, continuing to serve as Secretary of State under Andrew Johnson. Johnson was to have been assassinated that same night by George Azerot, but the would-be killer chickened out. With the assassination of, Vice Pre of Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson became president. Johnson had Seward continue as his Secretary of State, probably a very smart decision. Probably Seward's greatest accomplishment as Secretary of State was his securing the United States purchase of the Alaska Territory in 1867. Alaska was a Russian territory. Russia believed Alaska had rich resources and it was a large land, over, land area excuse me, for expansion. The United States didn't really like Russia having a territory in North America as it didn't fit in with the United States' belief in manifest destiny, that it was inevitable and right for the United States to expand all the way west to the Pacific Ocean. Lacking in the sufficient finances to make Alaska a highly settled Russian territory, the Russian government offered to sell Alaska to the United States in 1859. But the United States didn't take serious action on this offer until after the Civil War. Many Americans felt that it was a foolish idea for the United States to purchase Alaska. They felt that Alaska was basically sickly, nothing more than a lot of ice-packed land. The proposed purchase had become known at the time as Seward's Folly and Seward's Icebox by those who saw Alaska as just a barren, frozen wasteland. Here are two cartoons of the time also showing opposition to the United States purchase of Alaska from Russia. Johnson was not a popular president. Because he had been a Southern Democrat, the Republican majorities in both houses of Congress were very suspicious of him. Of course, Johnson was impeached by the House of Representatives largely for political reasons. 
This cartoon shows how Secretary of State Seward felt that the purchase of Alaska would be a good thing for Johnson, just like the barbarous applying a soothing cream to the head after shaving the top of the head. Despite much public opposition, Seward persisted in securing the purchase of the Alaskan Territory from Russia. On March 30, 1867, on behalf of the United States, Seward agreed to purchase the Alaska Territory from Russia for $7.2 million. The Senate approved the Treaty of Purchase on April 9, 1867, but only by a margin of one vote. Alaska was formally transferred to the United States on October 18, 1867. Of course, today we realize just how great a bargain the United States got for purchasing the entire Alaska Territory for only $7.2 million. Its oil supplies have become a major source of oil production. Alaska, of course, is a great natural preserve and tourist attraction. At the end of Andrew Johnson's years as president, Seward retired to his home in Auburn. His wife had basically lived in their or Auburn home throughout the years that Seward had been in Washington, D.C. as Secretary of State, so she was glad he was home. The home was rather elaborate, with a large dining room and a large formal parlor for entertaining guests. In those years after Secretary of State, Seward also traveled extensively. He traveled across North America on the newly completed Transcontinental Railroad. In 1870-71, to 71, he visited Japan, China, India, the Middle East, and Europe. In this picture, you see a picture of the main staircase to the second floor of the house. You will note that there are pictures of many of the people and places of his trips. Back home in Auburn after that long trip, Stu Seward started work on his memoirs, but he soon changed to writing about his travels instead. He died on October 10, 1872, there in his home. He is buried in the Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn. There are statues of Seward in various places around the United States besides Auburn. These places include Madison, Wisconsin, and Seattle, Washington. William Henry Seward had a distinguished political career. A biographer of Seward wrote, his foreign policy built for the future. He wished to prepare America for the great era which lay ahead. So he sought naval stations and peacefully additional territory. Another biographer wrote, Seward believed not only in territorial expansion, but in a commercial and diplomatic empire. He encouraged immigration to the United States, always seeing immigration as a source of strength. He was prepared to back up words with arms, and he believed that Washington was the natural center in the world for inter-American and international discussion. If he were alive today, he would not be surprised to learn that many of the most famous Americans are first or second generation immigrants, or that New York City is the world's financial center, or that the headquarters of the World Bank and the Organization of American States are both in Washington, D.C. Seward would not be surprised by these developments. He would be pleased. I hope you have enjoyed this segment which is part 
of our Finger Lakes History Series. <laughs>